valued viewers. I hope you are all doing very well. And a very special shout out to my Super Thanks contributor at Craig Bryant 8493 for his contribution. And because he did contribute over $20 to the channel's efforts, he has elected to do a custom video and his choice was the dirty worker of refueling a steam locomotive. To begin the video, I would like to give a really big shout out to the coal mining workers of past and present day. As simply stated, it remains today one of the most hazardous jobs that you could do in the United States in terms of both health and physical uh, demand of the job itself. And especially in, you know, back in the day, you know, 100 years ago, 150 years ago and whatnot, simply because the coal mining industry, the, the employers themselves, generally had control of the lives of their workers. So, and that's not only the working conditions, that's also the fact that they controlled the housing and the mercantiles that were in the towns surrounding the coal mines themselves. So to give you an idea, modern science today has, you know, since discovered that coal dust itself contains lead, mercury, and arsenic. So if you're breathing in this coal dust, you know, mining it or handling it directly out of coal chutes like you would at a railroad uh, facility, you know, you're at great risk of developing some kind of cancer or, you know, and what have you, anything that's related to those kinds of uh, heavy metals getting into your body. And today, some towns have, are even looking into going so far as to banning coal trains themselves from going through their towns, such as Portland here in Oregon, because they believe dust coming off these long coal trains, you know, are contaminating the kids and whatnot in, in and around the neighborhoods. Of course, there's no kind of scientific evidence to back that as of yet that this kind of contamination is to a level that would harm neighborhoods as a coal train would pass through, but they're looking into it. So anyhow, big shout out to those who work in that industry today and in the past, because those workers were a big reason, especially 100 years ago, you know, how the nation got to be built the way that it is today. So back in the age of steam, the procedure to do uh, before you put a locomotive into the roundhouse would be that a uh, yard worker removes ash from the locomotive ash pit. After a run, before going into the roundhouse, the locomotive grates are shaking down to remove any ash clinkers or other substances. And when this is done, the little cart moves the ash of unburnt coal to the car on the left. Oftentimes, this material is used for ground fill and train yard or along the right of way. So if you were a kid, um, of a certain age and you were walking along the railroad tracks and you saw this cinder looking stuff well what that's what that stuff was was a material that was left over from the fireboxes of these steam locomotives so the coal chute or coaling station as it was sometimes known dates back to the late 1800s as steam locomotives became larger and required a larger fuel capacity as with steam locomotives themselves they were all different sizes of towers and it became much larger into the 20th century to a point that some of the last towers ever built were built from reinforced concrete and stood hundreds of feet tall. Today, of course, the structure's purpose has long since passed. However, several of the last towers constructed were so well built that several still stand to this day over a half century since they were last used. But till the 20th century, virtually every steam locomotive used coal as their primary fuel source, although the very early locomotives designed such as the American 440 used wood, and they all had large tenders of water to produce the necessary steam. Coaling towers grew in size as needed with increasingly larger steam locomotives. Some of the first coaling towers were only a few stories tall and held less than 100 tons of coal, usually also only serving one track. However, as larger locomotives like the 462 Pacifics, the 284 Berkshires, or the 484 Northerns were introduced in the late 19th and early 20th century, it was obviously necessary to increase the tower sizes. The workings of a coaling tower are relatively simple. They were always gravity fed with the steam locomotive sitting below or nearby, if, the to if that is, if the tower employed chutes, and an operator would feed coal into the tender until it was topped off. To refill the towers, they usually had a staging track or an area where loaded hopper cars would be unloaded, and a pulley belt driven system would pick up the coal and load the bin. The very very earliest of systems were very rudimentary using straight chains and pulley buckets, but later systems used conveyor belts to efficiently load coaling towers. At their peak, coaling towers were impressive structures standing multiple stories high and looking more like massive grain bins someone might see on a road trip out on the plains. In the early years of railroads, coal was actually shoveled by hand into locomotive tenders. 
And really, I can't imagine doing that job at all. And there were some rail yard facilities that had coal elevators that would lift entire railroad cars themselves and dump them into their bins. Along with coal replenishment, sanding pipes were often mounted on coaling towers as well, and that was to allow simultaneous replenishment of the locomotive sandbox. When it comes to replenishing water, during the very early days of steam locomotives, water stops are necessary every 7 to 10 miles and consume much travel time. Imagine that. With the introduction of tenders, basically trains could run 100 to 150 miles uh, without needing a refill of water. As the U.S. railroad system expanded, large numbers of tank ponds were built by damming various small creeks that intersected the tracks in order to provide water at the water stops. Large mold baths were often stocked in the tank ponds, so don't be surprised if you wind up with a bass in your, in your tender car. Many water stops along new railways involve, evolved into new settlements, and when a train stopped for water and was positioned by a water tower, a member of the engine crew, usually the fireman, swung the spigot arm over the water tender and jerked the chain to begin watering. This gave rise to a 19th century slang term, jerk water town. For towns too insignificant to have a regular train station, some water stops grew in established settlements. For example, the town of Colinga, California, formerly Coline Station A, gets its name from the original coal stop at this location. On the other hand, with the replacement of steam engines by diesel locomotives, many of the then obsolete water stops, especially in deserted areas, became ghost town. And further yet, several of the most modern steam locomotives actually had scoops to pick up water along the way, so they didn't even have to stop at all. And also, during the days of the Wild West, isolated water stops were among the favorite ambush places for train robbers. With the adage of time is money, especially in a railroad environment, it took an hour in the Norfolk and Western's case or longer to fuel and you know, do general maintenance on a steam locomotives, whereas it took a diesel engine 10 minutes to be refueled and ready to go. That, among the long list of reasons why diesel power took over the railroad industry. And not to be lost among all of this, but then there's the job of the fireman in the steam locomotive itself. And especially in the earlier days, the fireman basically had to hand shovel the coal into the firebox and also stick a long metal rod into the firebox itself to break up clinkers, which are basically dense pieces of coal that aren't burning properly. So in that job, you're doing all that and also keeping an eye on the water gauges and whatnot along with the engineer to make sure the thing doesn't blow up from running out of the water, you know, and exposing the crown sheet. Of course, in more modern steam locomotives, you wound up with automatic stokers and, you know, uh, uh, feed systems, you know, that took the coal in from the coal car that way. But in the earlier days, you would not want to be a fireman. At least I wouldn't. But I suppose that would be the next necessary step in order to become an engineer of a locomotive. And one piece of information that I never could locate, and maybe you all can help me in the comments below with this one, was especially in the railroad yards, was doing the cleanup work on the locomotives. In other words, f uh, refueling, uh, dumping the fire, you know, and stuff like that. Were those the entry-level jobs of the railroad industry? Again, let me know in the comments below. And with that, I'll wrap up the video. If you enjoyed the content today, please hit the like button. And also, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't subscribed, as both features help the channel grow immensely. And also, there is the Super Thanks button. Any contribution is welcome towards the channel's effort. And if you don't want to contribute that way, you can visit our print shop at Nickel Plate Limited on Etsy.com. And we thank you very much.